I'm the director of studies for archaeology at Corpus. In fact, I'm a fellow at uh, St. John's College. I went there originally to do classics a very long time ago and then changed to archaeology halfway through and it uh, changed my life. Um, and so I'm a, you know, an academic who's therefore doing a, a few weeks field work most years. Um, Craig is a graduate of Cambridge. Uh, he's a professional archaeologist, so he's working for the Cambridge Archaeological Unit, which are the, the people working every day, rain or shine, um, doing uh, developer-funded um, archaeology. So, and we, 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 we put this title, you know, what do we learn from old bones? So you're going to have two very, very different talks. Um, the, to, you know, what, what can we learn from them about the living, which is what we're interested in. And, you know, archaeology, people often say, is it an arts or a science? Well, the answer is yes. Um, you know, we're, they're, they're, we use methods of the humanities. We use loads of methods of the sciences. But it's a humanities subject in the sense that at the heart of it, what we're interested in is people, past people, and what they also tell us about the present and the future. Um, so we're, we're driven by questions about um, us uh, and, in, and in my talk about people who are slightly like us, but not quite like us. They are in some ways, not others. So I'm talking about some work I'm doing at the moment, have been doing for several years uh, on the Neanderthals of Iraqi, of Shanidar Cave. Yeah, why are we... Why are we not moving on, James? Have you clicked into your presentation? Well, I thought I had it seen up. Um, I stopped screen sharing and then try again if I'd open the right thing up. Um, screen share. This should be it, shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Try again. I've opened it up correctly. The yeah, room business, yeah. Um, so who are Neanderthals? Well, we call them that because the first ones were found in the 19th century in the Neander Valley. Um, you can see there, they stretched right across from um, the Atlantic, right across to the Ural Mountains in Russia. Um, and they stretched on the north from um, up here in northern England, Sheffield, that is one of the areas outside Sheffield, there's some Neanderthal sites, all the way down to us at Shanidar Cave. So they covered a huge amount of what we call Eurasia, Europe and Asia, and they, and they lasted for, well, certainly around 400 and even 500,000 years ago to about 40,000 years ago. Um, how are they similar and different to us? Well, physically, you can see the sort of shorter stockier um, and there are a lot of things about the, the, the skull in particular that are rather different from us. And we have this very rounded skull and, uh, and, a, and a prominent chin. Um, so there are differences like that. Um, but, 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 but people have always said, you know, you wouldn't really, I mean, if you had a Neanderthal sitting on the bus, you know, you, you wouldn't see a dramatic difference. So they've, um, and so they, are, they, have, they have got these physical differences. We know that our origins are all in Africa, but then Neanderthals evolved within Eurasia. Our species, Homo sapiens, evolved in Africa and then spread out into Eurasia. So Neanderthals are around for, say, half of um, 500,000 years. Um, modern humans that spread out of Africa um, and they spread across Eurasia from, well, between 100 and 50,000 years ago. But certainly they're coming into Europe about 40,000, and that is when Neanderthals disappear. So there have been this whole debate, so therefore, about why Neanderthals are so successful for so long. Why do they disappear at the same time that our own species is spreading out of Africa right across Eurasia, right down into Australia and, and 20 or 30,000 years ago across into the Americas. And what, and what makes it even more interesting is that we now know from genetics that in places, Neanderthals and modern humans were interbreeding. 
but they certainly encountered each other. Um, they've had this terrible press for a long time. Um, you know, the, the, the cave man, cave woman, and you've got some typical images there. But more and more, we're thinking um, that, that, well, the more we know about Neanderthals, really the more complicated we can see their behavior is. And you've got a, some reconstructions there, uh, present day reconstructions of how Neanderthals um, would have looked. This, this wonderful woman um, was at a Paris exhibition, uh, Neanderthal model, dressed in, uh, in French designer clothes. Um, and you can see here that there is evidence, did they bury their dead or not? And if they bury their dead, I mean, did they just bury them? Well, I mean, what's going on in their heads when they're burying them? Uh, did they look after the sick? We'll see from Shanidar. Did they use symbols like we do? Did they make art? Um, how complicated was the hunting and gathering that they survived? And could, could, they, could they control fire? Could they cook? There's huge debates about them and about how complicated they were, how like us or not like us they were. We know from the ancient DNA they inter we interbred. Anyway, Shanidar Cave has been critical in this reassessment of Neanderthals from the original excavations that took place, an American professor called Ralph Selecki in the, well, between 1951 and 1960. So this is the cave where we've gone back to. You see, it's right at the top of Iraqi Kurdistan, so we can see the mountains of the borders of Turkey up here and the borders of Iran there. This is the cave looking up to it in the spring. And you can see the cave is up here looking up from the what's called the Greater Zab River in the spring. And then in the summer, how dry and burnt it is. And this is standing at the top of the cave looking down towards the river again in, in spring and summer. It gives you an idea of, of where we are. It, it's, it's sort of eight, 900 meters above sea level. So Ralph Selecki did these amazing pioneering excavations through the 50s. The cave was occupied by shepherds. They would come in, in for the winter months um, with their animals, and these were the houses there. Well, he put a big trench right down the middle. That's it here. You can see him with the, the workman. This is, this is um, he, he's here, Ralph Selecki's here. He, he died really just a few years ago in his hundreds. Um, amazing pioneering excavations. Uh, employing local workmen, training them, and so on. They were extraordinary. There were massive boulders. They had to use dynamite to break up. Amazing, amazing um, problems that he faced. Anyway, he. This is a, a a summary stratigraphy, a drawing of that fourteen meter trench, the, the the side of it, and he divided what he found into these different phases A, B, C, D. But basically, he found Neanderthal bones down at different levels here from in the lower half of the trench. And they were associated with what we call Middle Paleolithic or Mousterian archaeology, which is the kind of archaeology that we find with Neanderthals in Europe. Up here, there was a different kind of archaeology, which is called Upper Paleolithic. He gave it a local name, Baradostian. It's assumed from here and from other parts of the Near East and from Europe that this kind of archaeology is made by our species, Homo sapiens. So it's a cave that's really important because it's got, it was occupied by Neanderthals, then occupied by Homo sapiens. He, with, with the methods at the time, they could only use radiocarbon dating for, 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 for working out how old things were. And it went back to about 45,000, 50,000. This KA means thousands. So 45,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago was the absolute maximum. So he could date down to here, but he couldn't date anything below. Uh, with the methods they had at the time. So that's the, the stratigraphy. But uh, these Neanderthals, it's one of the biggest collections found of Neanderthals. Um, he found up to well, 10 men, women, children. And the first one he found, Shanidar number one, um, had got absolutely massive injuries uh, as a young man, this person had had a, I mean, he'd lost part of an arm. He'd been, he had a massive head injury. So he, he must have been partly blind, partly deaf. But he'd been buried, or he'd placed there as an adult. And so the implication of that is that these hunter gatherer band, people, this is people living in groups of 25 to 50 people, men, women, children, highly mobile hunter gatherers. The implication is they must have been looking after him. So it's always seen as one of the first signs of compassion 
um, in this species that's our closest evolutionary cousin. At the same time, uh, another of the Shenandoah burials a few years ago when they studied it, um, they found it had got a, uh, on one of the ribs, it got a puncture wound, probably from a spear. So we've got, we've got compassion, we've got aggression. Um, this is Shanidar number one, but most famously, uh, one of them, he thought, had been buried with flowers. So Selecki thought that some of the bodies were natural deaths, that, that, that rocks had fallen down in the cave onto them and crushed them. But some, he thought, might be true burials with grave markers. And this is the book he wrote um, in the 70s, the flower time, calling it the first flower people from this flower burial, which you see down here. Um, this gives you some flavor of the excavation. When they found the, the body that, that, that had got pollen of flowers around it, they encased it in wood and plaster here. They cut round it and made this kind of huge coffin thing. You can see this kind of mini railway they built to get things up out of the trench. They pulled it up and they got it then, carried it um, up, up and they got it on the roof of a taxi and got it down to Baghdad to the museum, this sort of coffin of, of soil with the Shanidar burial on the top. And when they excavated it, they found they'd got this burial on the top, a male, the one that they thought had been buried with flowers. And underneath were a couple of adult females. They were given different numbers in the mixed up bones and also a baby in really what's a tiny space. Um, this is the flower burial. What happened is this is the burial as they found it. And they, they took earth from around the body and sent them to um, a very well-known um, specialist looking at fossil pollen. And when she got the pollen, the woman called um, Arlette, uh, a French, what's called a palynologist, she found pollen of flowers, the kind of flowers that grow around the cave now in spring. And she, she, in the, she went through various explanations for why it might be there. And in the end, particularly because the, the, the pollen was in clumps, very unusual clumps, she said that a, a, a logical explanation was that the Neanderthals had buried this body with flowers. And the Shanidar flower buried is something that really any every first year student taking archaeology around the world, if there's a question about Neanderthals in their exams, the Shanidar flower buried was always mentioned. Um, and if the you know, question about you know, Neanderthals were nasty, brutish, short or whatever, they talk about the evidence and they say more evidence for more complex lives and the Shanidar flower burial. It has been much debated um, because it was argued that possibly the workmen had carried in the pollen on their feet, um, that the workmen so the, the, had the pollen just got in there by people working, working, you know, imagine the workmen around here and you saw that picture of them, you know, carrying the, uh, digging it out and making that kind of coffin-like collection of, of earth to get it out of the cave. But also there are little burrowing animals, jurors like hamsters, and they burrow and they tend to take the seeds of flowers down into the ground. So some people said, no, no, you know, it wasn't real that it was um, that the pollen was there because um, it wasn't that people had brought it, but animals had brought them down. So it's been debated and debated. So Shanidar has been this extraordinary um, site that, that's changing you know, our ideas. Uh, it started the process of a lot of rethinking about the Anatars. Now, why should we be interested in burial? Well, you know, how we treat our dead you know, is hugely variable today. When you think we, we know, of, we see these pictures here, you know, different kinds of burial forms, mummies, cremation we know of with, with bones put into pots, um, different kinds of burials put out here over the water, burning ships, bodies exposed. There are many, many different ways. And, and so they, they, they tell us an awful lot of, uh, about ourselves and our own ideas about ourselves and our place in the world and our sense of if there is an afterlife or not and so on and so forth. So, but, which is why, therefore, they, you know, we, we, we can try to learn a lot about the lives of ancient people from what they're doing with their dead. One argument with the Neanderthals at Chanada, for example, was people said, well, perhaps Neanderthals did occasionally bury their dead. I mean, wolves and hyenas come into the cave now. And it said, well, perhaps sometimes Neanderthals buried bodies to keep them away from predators, you know, keep the smell away and so on. So, you know, there, there is a sort of functional 
aspect to what they were doing with the bodies, but but without the sort of symbolic behaviours, the funerary behaviours that, that, that we associate with burial. So I was invited to go back to the cave. I mean, I couldn't believe it when I got the invitation from the, the government of Iraqi Kurdistan. And, uh, and eventually we were, we started actually in 2014. I was invited in 2011, but by the time we'd set it up and got the permits and got the money and so on, we started in 2014, but that was when ISIS attacked right across the region. So we had to stop there. So we really only started digging in 2015 and we've been back um, again and again. When we found it, the cave, you see, it, the, 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 the trench had been pretty much filled up um, never properly filled up because um, Selecki intended to go back, but he couldn't go back because of the politics of, um, of Iraq. Um, what he, where he found, he, this is that trench through the cave. It was a north-south trench, but he, he did an extension at the side, which is kind of here. Um, and this is his view, his picture of that main trench and that extension. And that's where he found number one, the body that was so ba badly injured. Um, this is where he found other Neanderthals and then the flower burial. In fact, this picture is at the time they were actually digging the flower burial down here on the edge of this deep sounding that went down to the 14 metres. So over the first few years, we simply excavated all the rubbish soil and stuff that had fallen in afterwards. So this is my photograph in 2016 of the same thing. So we worked out that's where he found number one, that's where he found number five. And I never expected to find more Neanderthals. We were really hoping to try and get dates, these new techniques of dates, and also to get a lot of information about the climate, because one argument was that Neanderthals eventually couldn't cope with climate change that modern humans could. So, and this is now, and you can see here down at number four, um, and gradually over the years, we, we've got down to, so we, we're down about this point, um, in, so we haven't got down to the bottom yet of where Selecki got to. We're down at around 10 metres um, from this surface at the top. But we've got down to, therefore, the main areas where he found the Neanderthals. And these are sort of methods, gives you a flavour of it, um, cleaning his walls of his trenches. There are new methods for dating. Um, these are taking little blocks of soil, which we then look at, glass slides of them in the laboratory. This is looking, taking... Uh, soil samples in order to see whether ancient DNA survives in soil. It's been a big breakthrough technique in recent years. Um, so you can get a, a DNA of any kind of organisms in the soil and of course, uh, right the way through to the animals they were hunting and see what species were they Neanderthals, were they modern humans. We've taken, um, we've cut small trenches down the side and then we wash absolutely everything. These are slightly bigger excavations. We wash all the soil then half the team spent hours and hours and hours going through what we've washed because the idea is to collect everything from this kind of excavation that's two millimetres or above, everything. Um, and this is a, um, a simplified, sort of stylized version of that, looking at the side of that trench. And these are the kind of trench things we've dug down. This is the, our reconstruction of the sediments, telling us about changing climates from climates that were pretty much like today to much drier, colder ones up to today, well, up, up to 20 odd thousand years ago. And then we've worked out, we've got down to say where he found the flower bale and the others and the other higher ones. Um, what, so what was the extraordinary discovery though, is we found a new Neanderthal down at the level where he'd found the flower burial. This is Selecki. This is the, the flower burial, Shanadar number four, at the exposure. You can see they're cutting around it, ready to make that kind of coffin. That, his anthropologist has got his hand on that stone, and that is this stone. So really immediately where, by where this crouch body was, number four, we found when we cleaned the wall, we could see human bone in the section. Selecki himself did know they were there. It was one reason he wanted to go back. So we're down here. So these upper Neanderthals there, we're down here. And when we excavated, cleaned them up, we were able to find the upper half of a body. It's probably a female. Um, there's a lot of tests going on at the moment. It's in Cambridge, the, the fragments. You can see this is the skull, absolutely crushed flat, like a pizza. 
that's a, that's three centimeters. You can see the jaw there. And then these are the, the upper body, the upper arms of that. This is part of the hand and other parts of it here. Um, and then this is underneath that too, is part of the backbone. So abs and absolutely crushed flat. And we're able to raise that. Um, it's been a tremendous task. I mean, somebody said that the, the best analogy for the state of the bone when we find it is when you take your cup of tea and when you dunk your digestive biscuit in it, that's the nature of the, that's how solid the bones are, that collapsing digestive biscuit. So we have to have all sorts of conservation techniques in the field to hold them together. And then we lift them in parts and then they come back to Cambridge where they're being analysed. And this has been the work that's been going on in serving them. And in fact, this isn't, that's a cast of Shanidar number one, but actually we've ended up with our, we call it Shanidar Z. I'm not sure how it fits yet, but we've got pretty much the whole now of the skull, which is subject to a huge range of analyses by different labs from around the world, looking for ancient DNA, looking at the plaque that you get on your teeth, because that's really informative um, about diet and disease. So there's a whole range of studies going on. Um, well, was it a burial? Well, in the end, we think that it is. Um, and this is one of these microscopic studies I talked about, a little glass slide. And what we can see from here is that there was a, there was a water channel, water was flowing around there, but the, the Neanderthals had carefully dug part of it. In all, so they were definitely, they weren't just dumping, they definitely made a grave and they put it in. And also in this thin section, we can see vegetation. Now, so therefore, a body is, you know, they're preparing a place, they're putting a body in it, and they're putting vegetation there with it. Now, whether they're just chucking thorns and things on top to keep animals away, or whether there's a careful burial, we're not clear yet. But all the indications are that we are, that Neanderthals were thinking about what's happening to these people after they've died, and they're definitely placing them. And they're placing them in this extraordinary cluster. So we've got our Shanidar Z, but there are teeth that don't belong to Shanidar Z. Um, and underneath it, we found a rib that we excavated um, last year of another Neanderthal, and there's more too. So there's a whole cluster. And what's extraordinary, when you think of that, that picture I showed you with Selecki's hand, it's clearly there's four or five or six bodies really within a metre, metre and a half, all being placed at the same place. And there was this, this here was is an enormous rock pillar that had come down before this happened. So these people are walking into the cave, seeing this special pillar there, um, and placing the bodies all around here. And it does look like, as Selecki thought, there are markers. They are placing rocks by the body, special stones by the bodies. Um, Shalinar one, uh, we've also gone back to to think about. Um, it was, um, it was, Selecki thought, it, because the skull was separate, he thought it had been smashed by rock, the head, the, the, this block of stone severed the head, um, and then there, was, there were animals there that were some kind of feast by the body, and also then heaped stones over the body. This is his drawing, and this is his photograph. Well, we've just had one of the people who graduated last year, Brianna Sykes, um, one of the things from the excavations that Selecki did, he, he did these fantastic drawings of the layers that he was excavating, and these have survived. And she did an absolutely lovely modelling job, doing computer modelling, looking at what the stones would look like if they were random and if they were natural. And in the end, she makes a very convincing, this is an undergraduate dissertation. She basically shows that it's not a natural rock fall, that they are placed there. Why she's wearing this, in fact, she was captain of the women's boat rowing team uh, as well. So a busy girl while doing archaeology, doing this fabulous dissertation and uh, on a winning boat. Um, so the other aspect that we come across is that we're interested clearly in what we can learn from the dead. But, but also what's extraordinary is really one of the questions is, you know, did they just bring the bodies to the cave and leave the cave as a special burial cave? Well, no, they were living right by it. These brown layers and all these little labels, this is evidence of where Neanderthals were coming and camping, making fires like that fireplace there. 
these the surface is full of the animal bones, the rubbish that they're, they're I mean, the animal bones and the animals that they're butchering uh, um, and eating, plants they're eating. So the, the bodies are being buried next to this big pillar in this tiny space and, and just really an arm's length away. This is really only just about a meter away. Clearly they're coming and they're camping around. So these bodies are really right by them, amongst them, where they're placing them. Um, and then it got colder and drier. All these rocks are coming down in a period when it's it, it, the, the world's climates, what called stadiums, got colder and drier. These are the ice ages, which is what you're seeing down here. This is a temperature gauge. This is the modern climate. And it was like today, 100 odd thousand years ago. And then it gradually got colder and drier um, in this period. And then higher up with these higher burials, including Shanidar number one, and, and we found bits of number five that he did. And what we've been able to show is that, that they were, it, it was much colder, much drier. Shanid, um, the Neanderthals came really quite briefly to the cave. They made little halves, and this is a fireplace. And from those microscopic studies, we can just see it's a, a few people have come in, they've made a fire, it, they don't repeat it, it's just like a one-off barbecue, they're little stakes, little, little wooden um, uh, stick, sticks around it. So I don't know what they're doing there, these stake holes. But this is a PhD done from one of our students. She looked at the rodent bones from the caves. And what she showed, these are, these are the rodents that live in forested environments. These are the ones that live in the, the cold and dry environments. And what she showed is that when the Neanderthals are coming back as the climate gets colder and nastier, they're only coming back in these little peaks when the climate is more like today. And the other aspect about living is just recently published. We, we've looked at the uh, those plant remains that are collected by washing the soil. Um, they've been studied by a, a team in Liverpool, a uh, postdoctoral student, and what she's shown is that both the Neanderthals and the modern humans, they're, they're, they're cooking food in pretty much the same way. They're, they were taking seeds around, you know, the, the things growing, seeds and nuts and so on. They were grinding them up, mashing them up, and then we think they were heating them on stone. So a bit like the way you might do a pizza or, or bread on a hot stone. So we're making some kind of mush like that. So again, it's another indicator of just how, how similar, because that, that it gets you into the whole, you know, we, we always say animals eat meat. I mean, animals eat food, humans have meals. When we think our whole lives, food is at this core of what we are as human beings in terms of the social role. And we're beginning to therefore see the you know, Neanderthals sitting around the fire, just you know, talking with each other. And another indication is we've got from just going through those, I said picking up everything that's two millimeters or above, we've got tiny little shell beads have been found. And they're typically thought to be associated with us, with modern humans here and elsewhere in the world. Well, we've also got them now down with our Neanderthals. This is number five, those picture I showed you. And down here, we've also got beads. So it's yet another indicator of how similar they were. So we're, as you see, the, uh, there's a similar use of the cave by Neanderthals, by modern humans. They're producing food in the same way. They've got this special place taking the bone back, taking the, sorry, bringing the death dead in to place by this, this big pillar of a rock. There's special places. We have this evidence from compassion for violence, treatment of the dead. That gives you some flavor of what we're trying to do and how it fits into these big debates, big discussions about our closest evolutionary cousins. Um, and that's, we're, we're carrying on. In fact, I should say there's going to be a Netflix film about all this in the autumn, um, which Shanidar is a centerpiece and all these finds I've shown you. Um, but these are where the bodies are that I was talking about. We're now about a meter below. We've got evidence for more halves and things, and we're going back in May um, for the next season because, say, we're on the Selecki way. We're, we think we're, well, we're probably around here now. I don't think we're going to get down to the bottom because our trenches are just too narrow, too small. But the work goes on. And that also gives you a flavor of what archaeology in the field involves that permeates right through our courses. You can see here people, teams from all over. Um, well, it's a Cambridge team, but we have a lot of specialists from different areas. And then the way we have to get money for projects, writing, you know, a whole range like that. And in particular, 
I think this is a finish just to show you, um, you know, th this is people's heritage. And when you think of Ukraine and Russia, and you think of the past, you know, I mean, archaeology, you know, we're interested in the past, but of course it, you know, an awful lot of the problems of today go back to people's ideas about how similar or different they are. And whether we're looking in this region or whether we're looking at that Ukraine, Russia, you know, the, the past is, is, is not a negative thing. Um, and so an awful lot of archaeology too is interested in what, what can we learn from the past. And here you have Kurds, of course, who suffered incredibly under Saddam Hussein, has suffered incredibly through those years, through the, you've seen all the press now about the 20 years since the Iraqi invasion and so on. And therefore, th these finds are incredibly important for them, for that sense of who they are and that sense of identity, which is highly politicized, of course, because there are Kurds in Turkey, Kurds in Iran, Kurds in Syria and so on. So there we are. Thanks, Graham. Um, a couple of questions. Um, I think going straight back to the start of your uh, talk, you had the slide up of where you where we have sort of found evidence for Neanderthals. And in fact, a couple of people have asked, so I didn't get their names, sorry, a couple of people have asked about um, why is there this big blank sort of in yeah. Kazakhstan, Caspian Sea? Is it is it absence of evidence or, yeah. or is it evidence of absence? No, absence of, almost certainly absence of evidence. Um, I mean, so much, so much of, of the history of archaeology, there was such a dominance uh, in Western Europe, Germany, France, Britain, those countries down into the Mediterranean. So from the 19th century onwards, there's been such much more knowledge. Um, and I mean, why we now have that in the Urals, I mean, excavation was going on for a long time, Russian teams uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a cave called Denisova. Um, and there they they found some um bones and and some were neanderthal and then some the, the ancient dna there was just a finger bone came out to a species that was similar to neanderthals but different um related to them. and they've, they've given them the name from this cave of denison of denisovans and it's and that, and that it's completely changed the whole landscape um, because we used to just think there were modern humans and neanderthals and now we know there's a a, a diminutive species in Indonesia. Another species was found a few years ago in the Philippines. Denisovans, Denisovan DNA has been found in some of the traditional of the um, the native peoples of the Philippines. So it's a it, so it's a very fast changing landscape. All of which begs the question. Therefore, I mean, a hundred thousand years ago, there were these weren't just yet. There were four or five species. Forty thousand years ago, there's just Homo sapiens. And we change from a, an African species to a global species. And as we become a global species, we're the only species that, you know, got this Neanderthal DNA a few percent in us, but there are no Neanderthals, there are no Denisovans and so on and so forth. So one of the big areas that I've been interested in a lot of, a lot of areas of research is why does our species for good or ill turn out to be so successful? Mm. It, it's evidence of, uh, it, it's largely where researchers has been. There was a famous study years ago, I remember in the 1930s, somebody pointed out in Britain that, um, that if you took the distribution of Mesolithic sites and the distribution of golf courses, they were roughly the same, where people were finding flints while, while, playing, while playing golf. So, <laughs> issue running right through archaeology. Yeah. Often, isn't it? When are we dealing with evidence of absence? When yeah. are we dealing with evidence? As, as Graham raised an interesting point, so uh, I'm an early medievalist, and someone made the same uh, pithy remark about Anglo-Saxon burials and railway lines. Yes, like, yes. It, 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 we, it's always that you you could be in your back garden, you could be sitting on a Neanderthal burial, but why would you ever know unless someone's come along and dug it up? I suppose. Well, and I should say, you know, that in many subjects, there's this really interesting relationship between theory, changing ideas about, in our instance, changing questions about the past and method and, and so on, and, and that's the relationship. And then every now and then, completely from off the stage, one does get new discoveries, which, which completely transform theory, completely transform method. Mm. And this is an area like it. I mean, one famous example, that ice man, that body found in the Alps, you know, com completely unexpected, completely changes. Mm. Um, Shannon the, the way we call it Shannon because we're not sure how it fits in. 
And we can't really work out how it fits to these other bodies that Selecki found, because they're mostly in Baghdad, until we can get to Baghdad. Um, but that's the case. It's the first, it's the, I mean, it's, it's half a Neanderthal, it's the upper part of the body, but it's the most complete one found for a generation, 25, 30 years. Completely unexpected. Complete, I never expected forever to find mm. it, find Neanderthal like that. So someone's actually just asked about the, a methods question, which I'm sorry, again, they haven't put their name, so I'm not sure who it is. But they said about, obviously, Selecki was working well before you. As a modern, as a modern archaeologist, would his methods be different to your, does that make sense? As an as a older archaeology archaeologist, would his methods be different to yours? I mean, many of the, I mean, the principles are the same. I mean, trying to work out that sequence of what's happened in terms of, you know, the sediments, the earth, the rock, and, and where the human activity fits in. He was trying to do the same thing. And I have to say he was brilliant um, at it. Um, radiocarbon dating was just starting then. Now, now it's much, much, much more accurate. Um, obviously, the whole ancient DNA molecular evolution, which Craig will be talking about today in terms of what we're learning from the medieval um, skeletons in Cambridge, all of that, the molecular the revolution has transformed um, what we can tell about where people who people are where they come from genetic relationships health disease um the techniques we can use so the many of the principles are the same the dating methods in our instance that that is a big breakthrough because um there are techniques now uh, to get at earlier than fifty thousand. so one suspects that they were probably the neanderthals we're probably using Shanidar Cave from probably about 120,000 years ago. And why I say that is there are methods of, of dating sediment. The last time grains of quartz saw the light of day, um, and it's a technique which go, can go back to the half a million years. We're, at, the sharp, at the sharp end, we're just taking a plastic tube and banging it into the sediment. But back in the lab, in our case, Oxford, yeah. they're then calculating the ages. Um, and those, and then there are other methods for, for dating stalagmite. That's also another technique. There are other techniques for dating the enamel of teeth. That's another technique we've used in previous excavations. So there's a whole battery of methods. Um, and time is such a critical issue for us. All the way through, there's the big time. You know, when are these, when are the burials? Are they 75? Are they 100,000 years ago? All the way through to, I mean, the really tricky question is what on earth is the time gap in these four or five Neanderthals mm. that, are, that are within arm's length of each other? Are they days, weeks, centuries? And that's what we're trying to tease out as well. So there are, mm. said, um, we think 120,000 because the world's climate, I showed that, that chart, the world's climate was roughly like today and even wetter and more humid than today, minus global warming. And at that time, we know from caves in Israel, which are dated, that Neanderthals spread south from Europe down into here. And that's where, mostly when modern humans came out of Africa. So the main area where modern humans and Neanderthals must have been around in the same area is from Israel to us, Southwest Asia. Um, how often they met, if they met, tiny numbers of people. Well, we know they met in terms of the interbreeding. They're huge questions, <laughs> the amounts of data, which will contrast with uh, Craig, which is talking about an area I think we know with, with much richer data sets yeah. in ways. That's the teasing part of these deep antiquities. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, I, I, I'm just, I'm getting interested, but I should ask some <laughs> of the questions that the students, students. Um, so uh, Lola asks, just to go back to the, the flower grave, have, have there been any other key sites where we have discovered the sort of remnants of po ancient pollen? Ancient, ancient pollen, yeah. I mean, pollen, yes. I mean, we've got pollen sequence up through the cave, and we use that as an indicator of climate. It's a common technique uh, in all parts of the world to use um, changing frequencies of flower pollen, tree pollen, to, as, a, as a proxy for climate change. So we use that. Nobody's found anything like that that flower burial in any other way um they've found i mean there's there's some arguments that there might be some grave goods 
But the difficulty, in fact, and when I showed you, we've got Neanderthals living where they're putting the bodies, mm. trying to demonstrate. You know, sometimes people said, oh, well, we've got bodies here that are they've been buried with stone tools. They've been buried with bits of meat, as Slecky argued. You know, you find animal bones. But, but actually, I mean, it's incredibly difficult. We can't do it with all our very fine techniques to demonstrate that you know, that there's bones and stone tools all around because they're living there. They're wandering around in it to, to separate that. There's, there's signs that there's evidence in, for cannibalism at some places. Um, again, that, that's probably highly ritualized going on. Um, there's evidence um, for um, feathers, eagle feathers being buried um, with, with some bodies. Um, and if I showed you that, that, what that modern image, people have argued, you know, were they, were they tattooing and self-decoration and so on? So it's quite complicated simply, but nobody had ever found anything like the flower burial existed. And, and we, amongst the team, we go forward and back about whether they, I mean, yes, animals do. We've got, we've got burrows of animals. We can see them. They, they, they take flower down. But Chris Hunt, my collaborator, who's at Liverpool, John Moores, who's a pollen specialist, says it's still true that the, these clumps of pollen are very, very, very unusual. So mm. he still thinks that this, and, and there's definitely vegetation with the bodies, but we're trying to progress slowly <clears throat> from, you know, is it ritual or is it just, you know, one of the differences, in fact, is he said actually the most common flowers are really sharp thistles, really spiky thistles, which kind of indicates, you know, putting stuff on the bodies to, keep animals away so we we come in the morning in the cave and we can see the footprints of the hyenas that are coming in because there's a spring at the back of the cave and they come in at night to uh, to drink when we're not there mm. okay <laughs> okay slightly terrifying to think to think that um and related to that question about sort of the ritual and the grave goods i mean have there has there been any evidence of and that they've put in a, a religion for neanderthals well one of the, I mean, it always seems to me we're, we're very, it's very easy to say, well, Neanderthals did this. Neanderthals didn't, you know, they, and we have to remember, you know, there's 500,000 years of Neanderthals and there's Neanderthals spread from, you know, the, the, from Sheffield to the Ural Mountains and, or, or sorry, west. And then, you know, there's a huge area. Um, you know, they must have, you know, done many things in different sorts of ways. So, I think we could never talk about Neanderthal religion, but but there's clearly an awful lot of ritual behaviour, which is more and more similar to, um, well, modern humans, as soon as we get modern humans. I mean, there are indications that Neanderthals did decorate some caves in France and Spain. Um, it's nothing like the famous cave art that associated with homo sapiens but there are indications like that so there are you know there, there are more and more complexities to how neanderthals were behaving and and symbolism rich behavior there's an extraordinary cave in france called brunichel which is incredibly difficult to get into it features in this netflix film the shanidar and brunichel and it dates to 170, 200,000 years ago when Neanderthals were getting down into a cave, which, which for them as now involves incredibly difficult caving. It, you know, you've got to wriggle through tiny spaces and get down. Well, now they're doing it with helmets and lamps or whatever. They get down and there are strange arrangements of the stalagmite down deep in this cave where, you know, what on earth is going on at 200,000? But it, it, you know, it, it's highly ritualized. It's highly symbolic. So the more we know, these are these are complicated people. Mm. Someone asks, um, so I think it's Lola asks about how much more information uh, do we have about uh, interbreeding between um, Neanderthals and modern humans, and I, I suppose also just more interaction between the two different groups. Well, we can tell from, I mean, the ancient DNA. I mean, we can see that modern humans did interbreed we we're all meant anybody who's not at, hasn't got african origins uh, has got this four to five percent so uh, neanderthals you know so there's interbreeding with neanderthals once modern humans are outside africa at a small tiny scale 
And what's extraordinary too, one of the in from one of these caves in Russia, I think it is Denisova. Um, well, because we, we've got evidence for Denisovans interbreeding with um, with Neanderthals, and it wouldn't be at all. So, I mean, there are there there is some kind of engagement with these dif these different species across the world. Um, and that's not, you know, and for all we know, I mean, we're dealing with you know, fractional, um, the Denisovans. Mm -hmm. You must be able to get the Denisovan skeletal record into a small box. And so far, fractional records for huge periods, but then there could also have been hybrid peoples that we don't mm -hmm. know about. Um, so, you know, big, big questions. Um, but the interbreeding, um, and I mean, I find it just mind boggling. I mean, uh, the, and one of them, um, some people said, well, you know, were modern were Neanderthals hunted out? That seems unlikely. Did they, did they die from climate change? Well, the difficulty with that is climates have been changing for half, for half a million years and they've been, they were successful through that. And 40,000, when the last Neanderthals disappear, they disappear from Shanidar, they disappear from other sites in Europe. They seem to last another perhaps 10,000 years in Gibraltar, but they go. And that's at the time when modern humans are really spreading right into Europe, right across to Siberia. And modern humans are down in Australia by 60 or 65,000 years ago. And modern humans, as they spread, these other species go. And, you know, it's tempting to look for a silver bullet. One argument that might be studyable in terms of ancient DNA is, you know, did, did modern humans bring disease out of Africa? Mm. Like when you think of Europeans going into the Americas in the 19th century and 18th century, you know, smallpox and how that, how the native populations were completely decimated by European new diseases that they were adapted to. Um, and indeed, one of the topics that, that a, a postdoc is studying, who's based in St. John's, who's looking at the material that Craig's talking about, and she's interested in what we can learn from the ancient DNA aspects from in those bodies about, she's not just interested in, in like how did people die, but she's also interested in what can these things tell us about how resistance is, she's interested in the people that got the disease, diseases and didn't die, trying to get at resilience. So that's another question of, you know, did Neanderthals not have that? Um, but I mean, for me, sometimes I think, well, people, the, the, Genetics do indicate that Neanderthals are getting more and more isolated in the later periods. So you have to imagine you know, a group of 40, 50 people, Neanderthals at Shanidar moving around. Probably they could have been in Eastern Turkey for part of the year. I mean, big, big ranges, tiny numbers of people. Um, did they encounter modern humans? Clearly very, very occasionally they did. And sometimes I've often thought, when we think of things like red squirrels and gray squirrels, um in britain um you know red squirrels used to be very very common gray squirrels now dominate they haven't killed off red squirrels um you know they they, they don't haven't as far as i know, you know brought huge disease they just seem to be much more effective and and you know at being squirrels that with with modern humans they've been very very effective as hunter gatherers very, effect, I mean, and that we can see they're breeding much faster. They're very, very successful. As soon as modern humans, the numbers go up, and we can see, see so it just seems more and more that Neanderthals are, are in, you know, they're, they're getting more and more isolated in small groups. With, often, with, you know, with, a, with that isolation, that, Graham, are they being pushed to more marginal areas in terms of resources? I mean, that's the assumption. Um, you know, these um, people on the, in, in in um, Gibraltar, you know, on the edge of 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 the the known world, there um, that yes, they are more marginalised. I mean, we seem to have more evidence down in Israel and into the, the, that lower part of the Levant than where we are. There are indications of Neanderthals and modern humans in Iran on the Iranian plateau. So, but I mean, they we assume that people are getting more marginal Neanderthals. And there was a there's been a common model that. Um, you know, whilst hunter-gatherers live in these groups of 40, 50 people, smaller groups sometimes, um, you need, a common model is that you need about 500 humans to make a successful long-term breeding group. 
that you don't get terrible problems of inbreeding. You need that kind of gene pool of about 500 people. Well, Neanderthal, I mean, 40, 50 people moving around our bit of the Zagros Mountains. You know, where are the other 450? How, how are those Neanderthals connected up? So there's something going on in the genetics that we can just see this more and more isolated group. So at the moment, people are saying, well, if you, know, you, if you can't just go for violence and, and we don't know, we don't know so little about disease and all we can see is more and more isolated Neanderthals and more and more effective modern humans. I mean, modern humans, they're in Siberia at 40,000 in climates that were considerably colder than today. Um, and uh, and they're, they're across by boat across some of the most difficult places to get to Japan at 40,000. Modern, they're in Tibet. I mean, modern humans prove incredibly adept. They're in the rainforest. There's the work I did in a big cave in, um, in Borneo, Sarawak, was looking at those issues, how humans adapt. You know, they get into these new environments. They're incredibly adaptable. So the big, big question is still about you know, why, why Neanderthals, but they just do seem to get more and more isolated mm. at the time of modern humans being phenomenally effective at breedings, colonizing all sorts of different areas. Mm. Big God, question. Okay. Yeah, big question. <laughs> How long have we got? Um, so um, I, I'll, I'll go, um, so we've got a couple more questions. So um, Isabel asks, as an archeologist, do you ever consider the ethics of removing ancient bones from their resting place? Hugely. Um, it's more and more, and it's, it's what, I mean, Craig, I hope we'll talk perhaps more about that um, because we've got there a, a, you know, a, a big cemetery that he's talking about hundreds of bodies that are, in the particular um, places, the, the hospital, which preceded my college, um, St. John's. But there are big issues about how they're both digging up and then how they're treated, how they should be treated, um, and, and in particular with burial at the end. Um, uh, there are big, big debates. Um, well, but there's, 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 there isn't much debate about how, how bodies should be, how bones should be treated with respect and therefore what should happen to them. Um, but uh, in the case of um, you know, in the case of these bodies, these bones, they're in Cambridge being studied. They all will go back, like all the other finds, the animal bones. Um, some of them are here. Some of them with specialists in other parts of Europe. They all belong, of course, to the modern state um, of Iraq. Um, and they've come out on permits, like in one of these things, where they, they then go back. And there'll be debates amongst the Kurds, uh, the Kurdish antiquities departments, about the um, you know how how one um, you know what should then happen. The I mean it's a unique find. Uh, they'll make a cast. I mean imagine the the cast of Shanidar Z, the original Shanidar Z. I imagine should should be, end up in a bank vault in Iraq, but there'll be casts which will go all the way around the world. But uh, it's a big debate about how bones and, and the Cambridge Archaeological Unit, which uh, Craig's in, is dealing with um, human remains all the time. Um, and therefore, there's a whole series of procedures for how they should be treated and how they should be buried. So uh, that I've over to Craig. I'm not okay. So, but yes, big, is, big issues. Um, in, I mean, we, we haven't got time to get into, but the whole aspect of, you know, the return of, of, um, of, of bones. Cambridge has been hugely involved in there were collections of um, skulls made in the late 19th century, um, early 20th century, which are in the Duckworth Laboratory and the Torres Straits Islanders. There's been a, I was part of a, a big um, a committee of Torres Straits Islanders and university looking at uh, what should happen, which ones you could really see where they were um, that where they were linked to individuals and so on and so forth. And and actually in the end, the Torres Strait Islanders felt that they sh that the, the 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 key material that were, that they could trace back to their ancestors should because they debated do we do we do, should they come back to the Torres Strait should they be buried in the Torres Strait should they be kept in museum stores or displayed and in the end they said they preferred um, that they should stay curated in Cambridge and they they conducted ceremonies in the Duckworth Laboratory and said that they they felt that the uh, the bones the ancestors were content to be where they were so big debates. Mm. 
another big question as well, isn't it, Graham? Um, so yeah, like another... Benin, Bro Benin bronzes. I mean, you know, they they're antiquities that that clearly. Um, in fact, I just um, Joe, who's one of the students you'll be talking to, Joe, for one of his pieces of assessments, they had to did a five minute video in which he got me talking about the issues of Benin bronze. You know, things like stolen antiquities. It's quite clear if they're stolen. You know, they, who who do they belong to? Not the people. Not the people they're stolen from. Then you get the more complicated things like um, you know the Parthenon bronzes, where they came out legally but in totally different power structures. Mm. The, you know the, the legal side of the Britain that said you know kind of sign here legally, and so and and you know so we're all in we're all involved in those sorts of debates, um, and there are no easy uh, beyond the things which are stolen. Um, no, there are no easy answers, and we've seen that there's movement now in ways that there wasn't between Britain and Greece about where the Elgin, Elgin marble should end up, and therefore what kind of material should be shown in Britain, and so on and so forth. So yeah, they're very, very live issues. It's kind of who owns the past. As I said, there's very live issues in terms of you know Ukraine and and Russia go absolutely back to different models of a past which are sometimes dominated by Russia and sometimes dominated by Ukraine, and there are different versions. Mm -hmm being taken up, which are feeding what's going on there. And then you move through to the, the heritage that's come out that's in the world's museums and those same debates. So the past is another country, yes, but the past is highly politicised in almost all instances. Mm. And then uh, just to round it off, Graham, uh, two more sort of, I think, course related questions, actually. So slightly smaller questions, hopefully. So someone <laughs> asked about uh, archaeology at Cambridge. Um, will there be more? Um, what's the split sort of between lab work and field work? Because obviously you've given us your example of your field work, but also we've talked a lot about labs, DNA, molecular biology. I, I would say, I mean, that thing I started off by saying, you know, is archaeology and art source science? Yes. Um, and, and, you know, there's a place for all sorts of people. Um, I mean, I'm quite unusual in the sense of at my senior age, I'm still very active as a field archaeologist. But the knowledge comes clearly from the field work and the lab work in this instance, driven by humanities questions. And I say my background is classics originally but I work a lot with scientists so and the and people coming the people we interview for archaeology have got all manner of ranges of um of a levels and I, I so when I changed from classics I I got absolutely gripped I went on excavations in Italy and Greece my first summer I was absolutely gripped by that whole combination between ideas and um physical things and lab things and i I worked on animal bones for part of my PhD, so I did lab things. But by because I've done classics, I've always been interested in this is a different complexity. I'm publishing a book on the Etruscans this summer. So I haven't always done very old things. I've I've written quite a lot on the medieval world in terms of landscape change. Um, so I think you can move, you know, that the and coming back therefore to curriculum, there are people who really choose the more humanities kind of courses and people who choose the um, the more sciencey courses. Um, I see that Eleanor is on the list. Eleanor's a first year doing archaeology, and she's contemplating whether to, well, I would say one kind of dark side, which is she's contemplating moving into the Egyptology language aspect, which is much more on the humanities side. Joe, I see, he's on a, a field course at the moment in Germany. He's the third year graduating this year. He's really enjoyed some archaeological science. He's doing an archaeological science dissertation. He's really enjoyed the humanities. He's done courses on prehistory. So, we're, you know, there. So I think that's the attractive side. And, and the final thing I also say about our course, like most archaeology courses, well, it's wider because we go into biological anthropology and we go into the ancient languages of Egypt and Mesopotamia. But, but therefore. Like most archaeology courses, we have courses designed so people come in most with very little idea about what they want to do. I mean, occasionally they come in with, you know, I've been passionate about Egyptology since I was a toddler. And then you get the people that said, I've already got interested in, you know, in my level, during my levels of thinking, well, I do want to do something different for my levels and so on. And that's all fine. And therefore, most of us, are, we're, well, we're trying to design courses that in the first year people can start to see the kind of things they're interested in, the kind of things they're good at, if, a, if they are a more humanities sort of person, more a sciencey person, or if they're a yes, 
Um, and then the last question for you, Graham. Um, so someone's obviously done some research again. Sorry, I haven't got your name. Um, done some research into the course already, and they've noticed that you've got the biological anthropology part. And they've just asked, do you do you have to have biology as an A level to study that? No, no. Easy answer. Yeah. I mean, there there are things which are easy. I mean, you can think of some very successful people who've come in from very different backgrounds. Um, and we, I mean, there are quite a lot of medics, for example, who take biological anthropology in the kind of the year off from their medical course. So they're coming in clear with that, and they do very well. In fact, the, the student I showed, you know, the, um, I think she was a, was he a bioant student or a medic? I should know, and I can't remember. The, the, the one who was head of the boat team, who did that lovely piece of work for dissertation. Um, no, so um, biological anthropology, I mean, you know, it, it's the more sciencey end, and generally, more sciencey students, but there's, um, I mean, there have been some very successful um, people who, I mean, they get, they'll get a feel for it in the first year if they take the, the basic biology course as the choice. And that's the other thing I should say, we, we, you've got, when you arrive to, at Cambridge, um, you, you don't have to choose the courses you want to take for several weeks. So we always encourage people to go to everything that you can and just get some sort of sense. And Eleanor is now at the stage of having to choose for her second year. And although the, 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 the department, of course, is saying, you know, what are you in principle interested in to get some sense of what the teaching needs will be next year? How many people might want to do Egyptology? How many people might want to do biological anthropology courses? It's still the same that the actual choices are taken when people come in the second year and they've got that time. Mm -hmm it's still this business of, of decision to decision which shape what happens afterwards 